Now, this was interesting. During their research, they found that men and women lied with equal frequency, but the very difference was the reason for that lie or deception. And what they found was quite interesting. Women were more likely to lie to make somebody else feel better about themselves, whereas men are more likely to lie to make themselves look better. <laughs> no surprise there. And this was interesting. Under MRI scanning, uh, research shows us that there's a lot of uh, mental processing when we lie. Uh, when we're recalling memory, um, there's, uh, we only use one particular part of our brain. But when we're fabricating or embellishing, and when we want somebody to believe us, we want to buy credibility and believability. So we've got to think, what have I said previously? I don't want to contradict myself now. I want to sound uh, believable and so on. And this is what they found under MRI scanning. Our brain lights up like a Christmas tree. Research in the US found that when we lie, we secrete uh, chemicals from the tip of our nose, which makes our nose what? Itchy. So often, if you've got an itchy nose, what do you do? You scratch it, you give a decent scratch, not just a cursory touch. And I was at a friend's place uh, a couple of years ago, and we heard a window break. And Ian goes up to his son, he says, did you break that window? And his son goes, <laughs> puts his hand over his mouth. Now, what you find in a social context, as we get older, you, if somebody asks you your, your opinion, you can't just say, well, no, 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 no. why has he got his hand in front of his mouth? So what you'll find at the last moment, there'll be a deviation in an effort to reduce the tension and anxiety and associated with lying, and you'll see a, a last-minute uh, change, like uh, you know, eye-rubbing, nose-tugging uh, tugging, and ear-pulling. Hand-to-face gestures are very good and indicative of deception. Now... Thanks, Brad, because I have the hardest job in the world to try to get volunteers on stage. After the last thing, it's going to be impossible. I need uh, one volunteer to start with, so can I have a volunteer? Somebody put up your hand. Anyone who would like to volunteer? Uh, okay. It's funny. People put death and public speaking up together, and some people actually put death ahead of public speaking. So can I please ask everyone to put up their hands? Everyone put up their hands. Everyone put up their hands. Fantastic. Now everyone put them down. Fantastic, I have a volunteer. <laughs> now, are you a good liar? No. I'm Steve Van Appen, and you're Danny. Okay, Danny, if I can get you to stand centre stage, if Mr Cameraman, if I could get you just a tight shot on Danny's face. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe a bit more distant. No, no, I'm joking. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do, Danny, is I'm going to ask you questions. I just want you to answer them que the questions truthfully, OK? I have to get behind the camera here. I'll just get you to stand there. OK, everyone watch Danny's face. OK, Danny, what, what was the registration number of your very first car? Stop. What just happened then? What happened? Which direction did they go? He's right, you're left. Now, one of the things there, thanks for that. How about a round of applause? Well done, Danny. That was easy. Yeah, that's all right. You can take a now, the point there is, I, the number of times I've heard people say, he looked away, he must have been lying. Well, he, in fact, looked away before I allowed him to answer that question. Technically, he didn't lie. Why? Because he didn't utter those words. I didn't allow him to get to that stage. But what's important there, if, say, for example, he's looking in that direction to recall information, usually what you'll find when people are accessing the creative side of their brain, when they're going to lie, fabricate and embellish, they'll access the other side. So holistically, loss of eye contact on its own is not indicative of deception, but often of neurological recall. A lot of people make that mistake. Now, the other thing I need is another volunteer, maybe from this uh, area. Can I have somebody come up? <laughs> OK. I'm really good at volunteers. OK, let me see. Um, OK, the girl who's looking away from me, uh, your name is? Hayley. Hayley, come up. How about a round of applause for Hayley? <laughs> you know what the definition of a volunteer is? Somebody who didn't understand the question. <laughs> now, if you could just stand there, Hayley. Now, Remember how I said before, what we need to do is we need to look for conflict or contradiction between what a person is saying, what their body language is in, in fact telling us. So what I'm going to do, Hayley, I'm going to ask you some questions. I would like you to answer the questions truthfully with words. However, at the same time, I want you to shake your head in the negative. You got that? Now, see the mental processing taking place? <laughs> see how you go. Do you play any sports? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, I'm over here. <laughs> okay, uh, what do you play? Am I supposed to be shaking my head? Yes. Uh, are you good at it? Okay. Now, did you see her body language there? Uh, often when you ask somebody a question, they don't know the answer. Usually eyebrows will go up, shoulder shrug, hands up. 
What happened there? At one stage, I thought a head was going to fall off. I didn't know where it was going. <laughs> a round of applause. Thanks very much for that. Was, uh, when I was in the police, I was interviewing this guy, and I asked him the question. I said, did you take any money that, from that safe? And he says, no. <laughs> Good indicator. The other thing we need to pay attention to is what we call qualifying statements. What's a qualifying statement? It's where some part of the person's response may be true, but they're hanging their hat on that. Uh, another example. Years ago, I had to interview a surgeon, and the allegation was that just before the operation, he was scrubbing up, and he decided to expose his backside to one of the nurses in theatre. So, under Victorian law, it's a willful and obscene exposure, so I had to interview him, and I asked him this question. Did you expose your buttocks to that nurse? This is what he said. I never, ever dropped my pants to the floor. Let's just analyse that for a second. Can you expose your backside without dropping your pants to the floor? Of course you can, to the back of your knees. What he said was factually correct, but he didn't answer the question. And that's what deceptive people do. They find some small issue of the overall uh, uh, question that they know they're being truthful to. I often say that there's no such thing as a bad interviewee, but there's definitely such a thing as a bad interviewer. Why? Because we don't ask the direct probing questions. Um, to give you an example how, of how language can bring people unstuck, uh, I consult my services to different police departments around the country, and they get me to analyse uh, interviews and give, their, uh, give, me, uh, give them my opinion. Now, how people use language, the content and structure and the delivery is really important. So I teach people to look for four areas. Verbal, remember this, uh, I can control what comes out of my mouth. Nonverbal, that's body language. Look for conflict or contradiction between what a person is doing and what their body language is telling us. Third is paralinguistic content. What does that mean? It relates to how the message is delivered. Could be things like tone, pitch, voice modulation, rate, response latency, ums and ahs. Often find when I interview people and people are fabricating or embellishing, we don't like pregnant pauses in conversation. So what you'll find is more fillers, unnecessary, superfluous fillers, such as ums and ahs. And the research points that out. Now, in this particular case here, just to set it up, um, Susan Smith, uh, in 1994, was driving her car in the US, gets to a set of traffic lights, stops the car, waiting for the lights to change. A gunman gets in the front passenger seat, puts a gun to her head and says, drive. So she does. She gets to the next set of traffic lights, he says, get out. So she does. He slides across to the driver's seat and takes off. Only problem is, her two children are still in the back of the car. And it was really interesting, and I've got the tapes in my office, and what happened was, after she reported this to the police, she's walking out of the police station. As she walks down the steps, a journalist says, uh, Susan, were you involved in the disappearance of your children? This is what she said, I loved my children. Now, one of the first things I look for is the use of tenses. If I asked you what you did this morning, relying on memory for recall. So you would be talking singular person past tense. You'd say things like, I woke up, I had a shower, I walked a dog. You wouldn't say I was waking up, I was having a shower, I was walking the dog, because that's present tense. Research shows us any time there's a change between singular person past tense and present tense, there's missing information. Now, what it, and trust me, if you've ever spoken to a, a parent who's had their a child abducted, which I have, they will never, ever speak in past tense. Why? Because the expectation and anticipation is that their child or children will be returned safe, alive and well. Um, what had happened was, when she said love, she's talking past tense. But what was even more telling was the next part. If you look at the top uh, paragraph, this was what she said, Susan Smith. She said, my children wanted me, they needed me, and now I can't help them. Now, compare that to David Smith, who was the biological father. His response, they're, they're OK, they're going to be home soon. I want to draw your attention to the tenses. Wanted, past tense, needed, past tense. And when she said, now I can't help them, whereas he's saying, they're going. So he's in hope that the children will be returned alive, safe and well. Well, interestingly enough, she admitted to police that she was having an affair with a much younger man and he would not be prepared to take responsibility for, his uh, for her children. So what he did was he strapped them in the back seat of a car, drove them into a lake, she got out, and they both drowned. The reason she was talking past tense is because she knew what happened to them. Um, I was doing a, a conference in uh, South Australia for their major crime squad, and they said, Steve, we'll just get you to analyse this uh, statement. What they did, for those that love CSI, there's a thing called SCAN. It's called Scientific Content Analysis. And what happens is they say, what we'll get you to do, we'll get you to write down everything ha that happened from the time you woke up to the time you got home, 
and found your wife's body, or whatever the circumstances. And it's really interesting. On this particular case, um, they found a doctor had been murdered in his surgery. And they, at that stage, all they knew, he had been shot at, at uh, point blank range. It was interesting because they said, we've interviewed one of the suspects, and they said, we'll get you to have a look at the statement. And I said, is it in his own handwriting? He said, yes. And he goes on, and what he does, he says, uh, I woke up, uh, and uh, I had, a, uh, had to go to the doctor, I had to see Dr Payesh. Uh, Dr Payesh is a family uh, GP, I've known Dr Payesh for a number of years, blah, blah, blah. Then he says, at 9.28 we had a formal conversation. I said to him, go back and interview him from 9.28, because not only can I tell you the person who wrote this is the person who killed the doctor, I can tell you what time he killed him around about 9.28. And the reason is, is because the change in language and structure. Firstly, he was quite formal, using a title, Dr. Payesh. Then later on, he said something along the lines of, uh, he referred to him as him. The one thing I look for is when people create distance, disassociation and separation. Bill Clinton, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. Um, often, when I'm interviewing people, uh, I want to see whether or not they maintain close or ownership of the story. Um, I just got back from LA and uh, I did a, a presentation over there and while I was doing the presentation, I said to one of the executives from the Oprah Winfrey Network, I said, what I'm going to get you to do, I'm going to get you to tell me a lie. I want you to put as much detail, content and structure as possible. You can have you know, an hour to concoct and fabricate and embellish, come up with a perfect story. So he said, when he came up with his story, I videotaped it, and he said things like this. Um, well, what happened was I went on my very first bungee jump, and what happens, you go there, they brief you. After they brief you, they take you to the, uh, the ladder, you climb up the ladder, you get to the top, they tie your feet. I was on the edge, and it was really scary, and then I jumped. Now, the problem with that is there was no ownership. I would expect his language to reflect and replicate past tense, but ownership of that uh, story as well. So when he said, you go there, he didn't say, I went there. He said, they briefed you. Who briefed it? Then he says, later on, you climb the ladder. He didn't say, I climb the ladder. They tie your feet, not my feet. So often, when there's changes in tenses, uh, there's often missing information. But nine times out of ten, we don't look for those changes. Um, the other thing we need to do is holistically look at how the message is, in fact, delivered. And I see this quite often. Um, uh, Channel 7 asked me to do a polygraph test on a guy who'd been, uh, who, he alleged, took photos of Paul and Hanson naked. And I spent some time with him, and nine times I just now, I can tell whether somebody's going to pass the polygraph test by the way they answer the question. So I use a behavioural question. One is, what do you think the results of this test will be? And I kid you not, his response was... I've never been good at passing tests. <laughs> <laughs> but there was no ownership or possession. I said, tell me, did you take those photos? He goes, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. <laughs> so lack of certainty and content in what he was actually saying. Now, just to wind up, I'm going to... Uh, just over the years, I've collected a, a number of things that have really appealed to me. And often, uh, we listen to what uh, people say and we think, oh, that sounds believable. Why? Because we get a gut feeling. Nine times out of ten, you'll meet somebody through observations, you think, yeah, he sounds believable. But how often have you met somebody and uh, you think, no, oh, that doesn't sound right. Just I, I don't know, I've just got a bad feeling about it. Well, research shows us, just in facial expressions, uh, you, I don't know if you've seen that program called Lie to Me, uh, Professor Paul Ekman did a lot of research and what he did was he found that um, uh, our face is capable of producing up to 10,000 facial expressions. Up to 2,000 of those relate to fear, stress, distress, anger and anxiety. So if you know what to look for, it's quite obvious. To finish off, I, I, I love this. This was Senator Al Gore's response when uh, he was asked if he ever used marijuana. Listen to this response. I don't think that's an appropriate question. If you ask me, have I done that as an adult in my career? The answer is no. That's a clear-cut, direct, definitive, succinct denial. Have I done that within the last 15 years? The answer is no. Have I done that anything beyond that? The answer is no. Did I experiment in college as a student? My answer is that's an inappropriate question. <laughs> and I'm just going to finish off with the last one. This was Sean Penn's answer to a journalist about whether he urinated into a water pistol and uh, showered a waiting crowd of photographers. Quote, I don't remember. I'd like to see it happen to certain members of the press, but I don't know if I ever did it. I would like to think that I didn't. I'm kind of thinking you would remember if you did something like that. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saxon. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen Van Apron, you had us in the palm of your hands. That was brilliant. Thank you. Now I'm really nervous about my body language. I was actually thinking about that TV show, Lie to Me, as you were talking. Remember that? 
Brilliant. That is precisely what Steve does.